Hi, I'm Charles with Anycap. This is my recap for the 2023 anime, A Returner's Magic Should Be Special. If you like my recaps, please consider subscribing. The story begins just after a battle has taken place and many casualties are scattered throughout the battlefield. A giant monster roams the land and is met by a group of warriors. Like most monsters, this one's able to speak without moving its lips and calls the humans before him foolish for thinking they could defeat him. We learn that Shadow Worlds represent the worst calamity humanity has ever faced and they're steadily shrouding the world in black fog. There's no way of knowing what goes on inside that fog, but the one thing that is known is that no living creature can survive in the land that it taints. There is only one way to save the world, and that is by conquering the Shadow Worlds. One of the heroes bravely tells the dragon named Boromir that it's time to settle things once and for all. This guy is pretty confident considering there's a bunch of dead heroes around, as he tells Boromir that he will be the one to slay him and bring an end to this accursed hell. Boromir gets pretty upset and that one guy that always points out the obvious yells out, here it comes. The it he is talking about is Boromir's fire breath, but my boy with the giant shield has it covered. Before the fireball can reach him though, it disappears as we see that our protagonist uses spell to stop it, taking away shield guy's one opportunity to do something. Boromir prepares another attack that's even more powerful, but our protagonist digs deep and stops that one too. His name is Desser, and he loudly states that his magical pattern analysis is complete. He has sealed every draconian spell. The humans go on the offensive, but Boromir is insulted that the impudent humans think they can stand in his way. He uses his tail to attack this time, and Shield Guy finally gets his chance to shine as he blocks the attack. The warriors jump in to do some damage, and the mage hits him too. Seeing as how this is the battle to end all battles, the mage decides to use up every last bit of magic they have to power up their female warrior. Desser encourages her with his battle cry, and she lands the final massive blow. Boromir screams out in pain as he is in utter disbelief that things are ending this way. Everyone celebrates and Captain Obvious speaks up again to say a single word, good. Desser is amazed by their great accomplishment and is glad that they can get out of this hell. Sometime later, the group celebrates, but one of them points out that they haven't received a message from the higher ups, and wonder if they defeated the wrong target. Mr. State the Obvious says that Boromir was definitely the right target, but the others point out that they would usually be sent back to their world by now. Desser doesn't mind giving it some more time since everything is over now. Spirits are high, but the mage ruins it, as he points out that out of the 155 million people who fought him, only 6 of them survived. The mood shifts dramatically as Desser begins to think about how this world took far too much from him, comrades he fought alongside and irreplaceable friends. The hippie of the group brightens things up by pointing out that they defeated Boromir and tries to change the subject. The mage explains that they can't look away from reality and 99% of the mages died. He wants to think about what's to come but the hippie tells them that they should pray first. Desser calms everyone down so the religious hippie just compliments shield guy for his sweet blocking skills. He is too humble though and gives all the credit to Desser. The mage marvels at how Desser was able to analyze and seal Boromir's spells with his circle, since not even he has such power. The mage points out that even with all that power Desser has, he was completely unknown, and he asks him how that could be. Desser explains that it's because he is just a commoner. The mage thinks that's a complete shame since if he had been at the magic tower, he would have made our boy a beast. They then go around talking about what they will do when they get back home. One guy wants to visit his dead friend's homes to return their keepsakes, because something about honorable deaths. The hipster is apparently the purest human being ever as she just wants to return to the kingdom to take care of the victim's families and build a memorial. The mage wants to find a way to prevent a reoccurrence of Shadow World, since if a similar one appears, it really will be the end of humanity. The warrior who actually ended the fight doesn't say a word, and Ruli just ignores the question. The others wonder if Desser will be returning to Hebreon Academy, and he thinks about a girl he once knew who would eventually die in battle. Desser states that he hasn't decided and just wants to get back home first. Just then they all sense something and realize that it isn't over yet. They don't understand the magic power they are feeling, and the mage is shocked as he is sure they killed Boromir. He quickly realizes something though. He explains that he once read that dragon hearts don't only pump blood, they also store and circulate vast amounts of mana. When the dragon dies, the blood stops and the stored mana with nowhere else to go explodes. Our shield hero steps forward getting another chance to prove useful and tells the mage that he wishes he would have mentioned that information sooner. Although he is clearly to blame for literally everything, the mage has an excuse as this is the first time in history that humans have defeated a dragon. 
The sky fills with light, radiating from the mana-filled corpse, and Desser is shocked when his spell doesn't work. The mage points out that it's hopeless. They're up against a pure ball of magic power, and even under perfect conditions, they wouldn't be able to stop it. Everyone begins to prepare for their lives to end, and Desser wonders if this is really it. His life since the beginning of the episode flashes before his eyes, and Desser finds himself somewhere else completely. He is wearing normal clothes and can't figure out what's going on. He hears applause in the distance, and a woman welcomes all the new students to Hebrian Academy. Desser remembers her as Professor Burgett, and she explains to the students that not everyone can be enrolled. Instead, they will all take a test, and only the top 600 will be accepted. Desser seems to know exactly what she's going to say, as she shockingly states that their test is to clear a shadow world. The students grumble in fear as that is far too dangerous, but Birgit tells them not to fear. The test shadow world is an artificial one created for the purpose of the test. As she speaks, Desser begins to realize something, but can't believe it. Birgit then states that they will now begin the entrance exam for the year 3613, confirming what Desser feared. He explains that the battle against Boromir started in 3616, and for the next 10 years they fought in that dungeon, and everything was destroyed. He collapses as he wonders what the point of it all was. Somehow, without pinching himself, Desser knows that it's not a dream, as he can clearly remember everything. Just then, a way too angry girl tells him that she was looking for him. She introduces herself as Lidoria, and tells Desser that she will be his mentor. Desser searches his memory to find that Lidoria is a genius of a mage who wields fire magic, and she plays first in the academy rankings. She is shocked to learn that Desser is a commoner, and points out that even if he passes the test, he will be placed in the beta class. This school is apparently really big on discrimination. It puts nobles into the alpha class, and commoners into the beta class. Even if you have talent, you can't receive a proper education if you're a commoner. They head inside and Lidoria wonders why Desert isn't more amazed by the school. Desert tries to say he has seen a similar building before, but she points out that there is no facility like it. Just then, the two are met by Elheim the Water Mage, and Desser remembers that Lidiaria doesn't get along with him. The two mages throw insults at each other for a while. Elheim mocking how short she is and Lidoria pointing out how annoying he is. Lidoria reminds him that she beat him in a fight before, but he says that he just let her win. Elheim is impressed by Desser's manners for sitting quietly, but has a good laugh at Desser's expense when he finds out that he is a commoner. He says that he won't be competition for him, and tells them to look forward to the test. Before he leaves, he gives Desser a word of advice. He states that even if Desser gets lucky and passes the test, he will end up in the beta class, so he might be better off not taking it. Just then, students are called to begin the test, and we see that Lidoria is all fired up, and demands that Desser pass. As they head to the test, Desser becomes more and more sure that he is in the past. This being the case, he looks around and is relieved to see that someone isn't there. However, just then, a girl calls out to him and asks him to stop looking around so much since he looks dumb. Desser is in utter disbelief to see that it's Romantica, the girl he had memories of. Desser has no clue why this happened, but determines that the reason doesn't matter. He won't let a certain tragedy repeat itself, and he vows to rewrite the history of the world. Desser calls out to his long lost friend, but this is well before they knew each other, so Romantica asks the weirdo how he knows her name. Desser explains that he simply saw her name on the screen, and they are in the same testing group. She wishes him luck as she leaves, but Desser can only think about how she has no idea how devastated he was to lose her. Our time traveling hero composes himself though, and promises to never let her go through such a terrible ordeal ever again. The first test is a race in the beginner level of the Shadow World. The Shadow Worlds at the school are safe, since they don't want to get sued by Karen parents, so even if students receive damage, they can evacuate immediately. Desser is surprised that they can still take damage, and Elham arrives to explain that the use of magic and attacks toward participants is allowed. This dude continues his villain arc as he tells the pair that it will be impossible for Desser to pass the test. Elheim then introduces the person he is mentoring named Desest, a magic knight. Our time traveling protagonist knows her well as she is a magic knight of ice, and a high circle mage who can wield vision magic which is impossible to inverse. She is better with the sword than most pure knights, and she ends up being his most reliable teammate. Lidoria and Elheim argue a bit more, but this dude somehow always gets the last laugh, leaving Lidaria in fumes. She tells Desser that his odds against a magic knight are pretty bad, but urges him to not give up. Desser's group is called to begin testing, and they all enter the shadow world. They will be aiming for the goal right in front of them, and only the top three will pass the test. They are allowed to use magic attacks, interference, and any other methods necessary to win. 
If a student receives fatal damage, they will be disqualified. Desser should probably be focusing on the test, but he's too distracted by his est. She was there in the future when the world ended, so he wonders if she too has come back to this world with past memories. She surprisingly knows his name, but it's only because she checked before the test. Azes completely roasts our boy for having below average physical abilities and ruthlessly tells him that he has no future. She couldn't help but notice that he has an eye problem as he has been staring at her, but she assures him that he has nothing to worry about since she has no interest in attacking the weak. She is clearly not friendly so Desser determines that she is not his loyal teammate from the future. The race begins and Azes takes off like she stole something, leaving everyone in her dust. Romantica follows after but slows down to apologize to some little furball for bumping into it. Desser gets right to simping as he points out how she must still like stuff like that, but she has no clue what this guy means by still, and she wonders if he's making some terrible attempt to hit on her. She gets pretty annoyed by how he's acting like they are friends and tells him to focus on the race. The simp just can't help himself though as he has missed interacting with her so much. She gets even more mad to hear these words but is shocked when Desser saves her from a random fireball. Some dude is pretty upset that Desser is butting in on his attack on Romantica and uses his fire rod to attack. Romantica can defend herself though and takes this fool out. His name is Eggs and his disqualification is announced to everyone. Romantica thanks Desser for saving her but instantly gets annoyed again by his dumb looking face. The two of them are falling pretty far behind so Romantica decides to show him her true abilities as she uses her arrow sweep spell. Elsewhere some higher ups tell Jesus with a ponytail that everything's going smoothly. They are particularly amazed to have a magic knight participating this year and they marvel at how well she conducts herself. They all have a good laugh though when someone points out that a weak commoner is in the same group as the great magic knight. They all pity the poor kid but one chick seems to know something as she stares pretty hard at Desser. A guy following Azest is confident that all he will have to do is continue following her to pass but is then shocked by Romantica's powerful wind. It's not strong enough to blow him away but he can hardly move. Just then he is shocked as Azest easily slices her way through the wind. This absolute idiot spends way too much time drooling over this girl and ends up getting a hug from mother nature courtesy of a giant tree. There was another guy next to him that got eliminated as well so there are now only 3 participants left. Romantica smiles as this means they are all going to pass but this chick is out for blood and tells Desser to just drop out. Desser wonders why and her reason is simple, his disgustingly stupid face. She praises herself for warning Desser so that he doesn't get hurt and gives him one less chance to drop out. Romantica anticipates his surrender but is shocked when he refuses. She can't believe he won't quit even after seeing her magic and gets furious when Desser simply smiles again. She has had enough of this annoying guy and she promises to hurt him so bad that he will think that he's going to die. She unleashes her powerful wind strike and says later to the dweeb. She is stunned though when Desser compliments her attack and sees that he is totally unharmed. Our boy is insane as not only did he survive, he's now pointing out how she prioritized speed in her attack and that is why her control is so weak. Clearly not caring about how much he annoys her, Desser recommends a slight adjustment to her attack and she completely blows up. Romantica prepares another attack that she guarantees won't miss and unleashes her venom wind. Desser really gets to showing off now as he does that thing where he explains what he is doing while doing it. He simply changes the air currents a little and forces her attack to miss. She is shocked to see him use an inverse spell since usually someone has to be at a much higher level or a circle as they call it to be able to use an inverse spell. This should be impossible for Desser to do since he is the lowest circle so she decides to test him again. Desser simply just blows up her attack this time and Romantica begins to lose her mind as she wonders if this means that his skills are higher than hers. The tables have completely turned now as our boy confidently says that they should finish up now. There are others he needs to defeat so he can't stay for long. He's getting too close for comfort so Romantica tests to see if he can inverse a whole bunch of spells this time. Desser easily stops all of them and thinks about how Romantica is very powerful but not powerful enough. This won't do since at this rate they will simply repeat the same future where she met her demise. He is determined to make her stronger so that is why he must be the one to win right now. Desser asserts his dominance like a boss and tells Romantica that inversing spells is not the only thing he can do. She is surprised to see him use a basic spell that erases friction and wonders why he would do that. Desser then shockingly reveals that she is actually not the one he has been fighting this entire time. The last thing he tells her is that they are not being tested on magic skills, they are being tested on who can reach the goal. Things start to become very clear as Desser explains that even if they receive fatal damage there, they won't die. Romantica begins to realize what this absolute genius of a man is planning to do but points out that while he might not die he will still take damage. 
Our boy ain't afraid of no damage and uses a fire spell to rocket himself at light speed. Romantica thinks he might be crazy, but it's really just a Riz King at work. Near the goal, Aziz enjoys a comfortable lead, but can instantly tell Desser will soon pass her. She has no clue how he defeated Romantica, but decides that she will have to defeat him with all she's got. She prepares an immense attack, so our boy completes an analysis on every link spell she is using. This allows him to obtain control over the entire attack, but Aziz realizes he is inversing them, and decides that she will have to end the fight before he takes them all. She instantly attacks with the ones that haven't been taken, but Desser manages to alter their trajectory. Azaz sees that he just managed to dodge the fatal blow and determines that she just won't give him time to inverse her spell. She combines her spells for her next attack and Desser agrees that she is making the right decision. Unfortunately for her, our boy is a beast and adjusts the attack's trajectory mid-flight. She is then shocked as he uses the blowback from the attack combined with his lack of friction to launch himself again. Azaz prepares an attack but Desser explains that she's too hung up on defeating him and he just blows right by her. Desser is announced the winner but that practically means nothing to him. Our time traveler looks at his friends and can only think about how they all, including himself, need to get stronger. It's the only way they can overcome the tragedy. Elsewhere, we see that a guy wearing a pretty dumb looking ring has just defeated a bunch of students and is announced the winner of Group F. His name is Dante and he stares at our boy's girl while giving her a creepy smile. Elsewhere, those in charge of the school discuss how as expected there will be no commoners in the alpha class again this year. All these people discriminate pretty hard against commoners as they say that the alpha class is only for nurturing the chosen ones, and commoners should just be happy that they get to enroll in Hebrion Academy. The top old man who looks like he's never shaved in his entire life silences them, and reveals that there has been a recommendation that a certain student be placed in alpha class. It was Professor Bridget and she confidently recommends Desser. Later, students check to see which class they have been placed in and Desser sees that he is in beta. However, what he is really concerned about is Romantica as she is in complete shock. Moments later, we see that Romantica is pretty depressed by her rundown surroundings. The professor explains that skills of mages are ranked in circles. The lowest circle is 1 and the highest circle is 7. To be in the alpha class, a student must be at least circle 2. All the students in this class are as low as it gets at circle 1 and their skills are not good enough for real shadow worlds. Romantica thinks that being in the beta class is bad enough but things are only made worse by her being in the same class as Desser, who irritates her to no end. She wonders why Desser is even there since he beat the Magic Knight, and is annoyed out of her mind when he just keeps on smiling. We then see that Bridget wasn't able to get the other professors to agree to have Desser put in the Alpha class. They are all nobles, so they strongly oppose the idea. Desser is furious not just for himself, but for all the talented commoners that are being ignored because of the discrimination. Desser decides that he must awaken as many talents as possible, no matter what it takes. Later, Romantica keeps doing her depressed thing, and that dude Dante approaches her. He is in the Alpha class and is planning to join Blue Moon, the best party in the academy, made up of the top students of the Alpha class. This rizzed up jerk came to invite our boy's girl to join as well, since she has excellent skills and perfect lineage. Romantica knows she must say yes since it will also get her into the Alpha class, but then this dude tells her that she will have to go out with him. She points out that this is their first time meeting, but this smooth talker tells her it was love at first sight. Romantica needs time to think, but this pushy dude gives her a gift that in his hometown is given to someone they are in love with. Romantica can hardly speak after that display of Riz, and is shocked when Desser appears behind her. Desser explains that he is there to make the same offer to her, but she declines to go out with him. Desser clears things up by pointing out that he actually meant he wanted her to join his party. It's pretty clear that she's going to pick the best party in the school over his, but Desser thinks about how that was the biggest mistake she ever made in the future. She tells our boy to beat it, so he leaves her a letter meant to be read when no one is around. Romantica mocks him for probably writing embarrassing stuff in it, but he tells her to get rid of it after she reads it, since it's for her own good. A quick read wipes the smug smile off her face, and she becomes furious, and Desser, who's long gone at this point, knew he would press her buttons. Desser then spots some blue-haired kid named Pram, and he is glad to have finally found him. Desser explains that among the warriors who participated in the battle before his time travel, Pram was one of the fastest swordsmen. He was the strongest in a timeline where he barely had any training, so Desser can't imagine how much stronger Pram can be if he gets some training this time. Just then, Romantica arrives upset that Desser seems to know some secret about her, but he tells her to quiet down to watch her practice. Romantica can't believe how adorable Pram is and wants to own him like a pet or something. Pram picks a weapon that shocks her pair since they wonder if he can really wield a great sword. Pram properly introduces himself, but his opponent refuses to speak to the beta class scum. The practice fight begins and Mullet Man is instantly surprised by Pram's abilities. 
Romantica thinks Pram is pretty strong, but Duster knows that he is just swinging his sword around blindly. Mr. Business in the front, party in the back, fights back with a relentless attack, but Duster knows and anticipates a counter from Pram. Duster sees that Pram is going too soon, as the red-headed mullet dodges and ends up countering him instead. The redhead named Percival is announced the winner, but he is unsatisfied with just that. He begins to wail on the poor kid while the useless referee just watches, so Desser jumps into action. He points out that the match is over, but Redhead threatens him too. Desser has a smart mouth on him as he asks Percival if he was upset that Pram's attack hurt him too much, or if he's just jealous of someone who's more talented than him. Desser manages to push every single one of this dude's buttons, causing him to attack out of control, but Desser blocks it with his arm. Desser once again reminds him that he won the fight, but frighteningly asks him what else he could want. Percival leaves but tells Desser that he will remember his face. Pram patches him up and Desser explains that he used magic to block the sword so it didn't do much damage. Pram apologizes but Desser explains that he was the one that chose to jump in. Pram points out that Desser now has an enemy in the Alpha class because of him, but again Desser says it's fine and he must tell Romantica to calm down because this girl's obsessing way too much about Pram's adorableness. Pram thanks Desser for rescuing him and promises to return the favor. Desser then takes Romantica somewhere they can talk in private, and he must calm her down by saying that he hasn't told a single soul about what he knows. However, he reveals that the professors know about it, which is why she was dropped to the beta class, even though she's a noble with amazing skills. Desser then puts it all out there as he knows that Romantica has the blood of a commoner, and her parents actually just bought the title of noble. The professors knew this and just think of her as another commoner piece of garbage. Romantica is certain that Dante will protect her if she joins their group, but he reminds her about how Dante called commoners filthy lowlives. Desser recommends that she join his party instead, and she becomes furious. She thinks he will tell everyone her secret if she doesn't join, and points out that he is a terrible person for blackmailing her. Our boy is in a piece of garbage though as he would never do that, and he simply says that if she doesn't join, then he will just have to start his party with Pram alone. Romantica's imagination runs wild with thoughts of the adorable kid, but she still struggles with her decision. She still thinks that Desser's pretty sketchy for smiling all the time and for knowing her secret. He acted super recklessly during the test and was somehow able to defeat the magic knight. On top of all that, he is somehow able to use the inverse spell even though he is at the lowest circle. After giving it some thought though, she decides to join his party, but mostly so she can uncover his secret. Romantica still hates his smile with every fiber of her being, but the two shake on their agreement. We then watch as Pram takes a good hard look at a strange looking sword. His mother handed him the sword that was left to him by his father and explained that as long as the sword shined bright, it meant his father would be thinking of them forever and ever. The second this poor kid touched it though, it fell to pieces. Luckily for him, that part was just a dream. Later, the new trio head to see Bridget so they can apply to form a party. They enjoy some snacks, but it's soon time to get right to business. This trick grills Desser about why he wants to form a party, so he simply explains that he plans to get promoted to the Alpha class by winning the ranking tournament. Bridget points out how hard that is, but Desser is already well aware. She explains that the ranking tournament is an exam to determine the ranks of students in each grade. It's conducted with the alpha and beta classes together, and eligibility to participate requires a party of 3 to 6 members. The exam takes the form of a battle between two parties, and the winning party's ranks go up. This doesn't mean that parties with more members have an advantage though, since individual achievements are assessed. There are plenty of ways to earn rank, since the key is how much a student has contributed to the victory of their party. The objective of the ranking tournament is to assess the various skills of the students. The winning parties will participate in the final rounds that take place in a shadow world. Those who place within the top 9 are given the title of single rankers. Single rankers are able to advance from beta class to the alpha class, however not a single person has ever been promoted before. This is no surprise to Romantica since the alphas have such a huge advantage, and she is certain that it will be a one-sided tournament. Bridget explains that it's practically impossible, but Desser shocks everyone when he says that is why it's worth doing. The professors all think that betas aren't worth teaching because they have no talent. So if all three of them and their party can become single rankers, then it would prove the professors all wrong. Bridget hopes that they can overthrow the horribly prejudiced system at the school, and asks Romantica and Pram if they are certain they want to join Desser's party. They do, so afterwards, the three of them walk by an amazing top-of-the-line practice facility. Unfortunately, it's only for the Alpha students, so they head to the Beta students' practice facility. It's just a normal room, in fact it's worse than that, since it's practically falling apart. Covered in dust with the floor creaking, but our always positive protagonist is sure it will grow on them. Unfortunately, they find that they have a ton of roommates, as hundreds of rats run back into their hole. Desser's plan is to clean the dump up, but Romantica is not a fan of the rats. 
Desser says he will take care of it, so Romantica admires him for going to find another room, but he reveals that his real solution is just to plug up the rat holes. They have no other choice so they just clean the place up. They do an amazing job but Romantica is distraught. Desser says that it's time to get going, so Romantica assumes that he means head home to get all washed up, but he actually means to start training. She instantly regrets joining his group but remembers her goals. She heads for the door but Desser points out that the training room is in the other direction. Training starts off with Desser training Romantica to improve the accuracy of her magic. She explains that she already has that in the bag as she shows off by firing several wind attacks right at the target. She is pretty proud of herself but Desser wants her to have all of the attacks hit the center. She thinks it's impossible but he explains that it's the only way they can beat the alphas. He is confident she can do it and thinks back to the future when she proved it in battle. Desser antagonizes her by saying she could keep cleaning if she wants to instead, so she gets motivated to wipe that smile off his smug face. To help with her training, Desser has her try to put a ball in a circle and he has to tell this silly girl that she can't just throw it. She's supposed to manipulate the air current around the ball to move it. Wind magic is her specialty so he just reminds her to visualize it. She does just that and Desser's amazed that she got the hang of moving the ball in her first try. He encourages her to keep going and she's just glad to have gotten a compliment. Pram is eager to learn about swordsmanship but Desser reveals that there's nothing he can teach him. Shockingly, Desser says that Pram has perfected his craft as a swordmaster and he should be strong enough to win the ranking tournament as he is now. Pram is sure that isn't true, especially just after Desser had to save him, but Desser knows Pram's true potential. Pram's amazing display of strength in the future is something Desser will never forget. He points out that Pram should be using a much lighter sword, specifically a rapier. Pram is clearly upset and hesitates to tell Desser why he doesn't use the more ideal sword for his style. Desser points out that it concerns the strength of their party, so Pram asks him to go with them somewhere. They leave Romantica but she's doing just fine on her own. They arrive at Pram's room where he reveals that he has no clue what his father looks like since his father went to get the milk a long time ago. His mother was a commoner and his father was a noble. The only thing his father left behind was a rapier sword. When Desser sees the sword there's no doubt in his mind that it's the one Pram used back in the future. It's insanely light and Pram explains that after learning that his father left it to him, he instantly started on the path of the sword. That way when he eventually saw his father, he would be a respectable son fit to wield the sword. One day his mother was on her deathbed and told Pram to never try to see his father since he lives in a completely different world than they do. She never even told Pram his father's name. In this world having a child who is a commoner is a disgrace for a noble. If Pram had visited his father, he wouldn't have lived to be there now so his mother was just protecting him. Pram explains that he still desperately wanted to find his father so he joined Hebrion Academy in the hopes of getting some clues. He explains that he had the Sword of Praise to help him find his father but he becomes furious and reveals that he was told that the sword has absolutely no value. It was not something worthy of a noble man. Pram breaks down as he thought his father loved him and that's why he left the sword but that clearly isn't the case. So Pram refuses to ever use that sword again. The next day everyone is hard at work practicing. Romantic is easily dropping the ball in the circle and is proud to have mastered it in just 3 days. Desser is quick to rain on her parade though as he points out that the ball isn't staying in the circle. Desser strangely stares at her while thinking about the gift she got and comes up with an idea. He asks Pram to show him the rapier sword but Pram says that he doesn't care about that sword anymore and so he can't show him. Desser pleads with him but Pram shockingly says that the reason he can't show him is because he sold it. We then get a quick look at a shop where a couple of menacing looking guys are in possession of Pram's sword. Afterwards Desser and Pram go to retrieve his sword and Desser's amazed to see that everything is exactly like he remembers. They arrive at the sketchy looking alleyway that leads to the pawn shop and cautiously make their way there. A sign at the front of the shop explains that there are no refunds for any reason and Desser wonders how these guys could be so obsessed over money. Pram tells Desser that he never wants to hold that sword ever again but Desser asks him to just give him a chance. They finally get into the shop where they are met by a steroid fueled giant, making Desser wonder why the place is so heavily guarded. Desser explains to the shop owner named Wuju Ken that they are there to buy the rapier that Pram sold. Wuju Ken points out that they have a no refunds policy but Desser tells this dummy that is why he said he was going to buy it. The man reiterates that the rapier has no value as a sword but surprises Pram when he reveals that he knew something was off because it was so light. Wuju Ken has an idea of what it might really be and Desser shows his genius as he already knows. It's called a Kamuvin and he saw something like it when that earring wearing dude gave his girl a gift. It's used by nobility to give a gift to the person they love, like a box. Unfortunately for this guy he couldn't figure out how to open it. Wuju Ken then shockingly reveals that it will cost them 40 silver, 
but Pram is furious since he only sold it to the man for 3 silver just the day before. On top of that, he didn't even tell him that it was a Kamuvin. This sleazy guy points out that Pram only asked him to appraise it as a sword, so he did and it was only worth 3 silver as a sword. However, now he is selling it as a Kamuvin and its value is now 40 silver. Pram thinks this dude is just a dirty swindler, but Desser understands that it's just business and pays the 40 silver. The guy wonders if he should have charged more, but Desser explains that that is as high as he's willing to go. Wuju Ken tells him that just looking at it won't do any good and an amateur like him won't be able to open it. This fool has no clue that he's talking to the protagonist and we see that Desser uses his unique magic to read some hidden writing. Desser then urges the hesitant Pram to take the sword and reveals that there is a groove on the hilt. Pressing this groove while removing the blade reveals that there is another blade underneath. Everyone in the room is shocked as this blade is neither iron nor silver. Pram has never seen a metal that shines like this and Desser explains that the blade is made from blanchium. It's harder than steel and lighter than a feather. It's metal that is used only in the highest quality weapons and Desser is more certain than ever that this was the weapon Pram used in the future. They get ready to leave but the giant behemoth gets in their way. Desser kindly asks the man to move the giant mountain of muscles but Wuju Ken will only do so if they leave the sword. Desser reminds him that they had a business agreement but Wuju Ken is a scummy shop owner and tells him that if the sword is really made from Blanchium then that changes everything. Desser points out how much of a hypocrite the guy is but this just makes the giant threaten them if they don't leave the sword. Desser simply refuses and easily dodges the muscle head's attack. Wuju Ken demands that he finish them off already but the giant is shocked to see that Pram has stepped forward. Pram actually hates fighting but it's clear that this guy intends to harm Desser so he decides not to hold back. Pram is embarrassed after Desser reminds him that he said he wouldn't touch the sword ever again, but Desser was just messing with him and encourages him to show what he's capable of. Desser is certain that this sword is perfect for Pram's style, but is concerned since the giant's attacks can be fatal if they land. Pram is still pretty inexperienced at this point, so he is uncertain if he can win. However, everyone in the room is shocked when Pram begins to glow, and his opponent is excited by the determination in his eyes. He tries to attack but Pram instantly counters and dodges, making it very clear that Pram is fast. Pram then demonstrates this even more as the guy can hardly see him. Pram is landing a ton of hits but they are just shallow cuts and Desser wonders if he's having a hard time gauging his attacks with the rapier. The big guy is getting used to Pram's speed though so if the fight drags on then Pram will be at a severe disadvantage. Pram attempts to attack the guy's vitals but the giant obviously expected that. Things are starting to look pretty bad but Desser tells Pram to believe in his father. This is when Pram notices the writing on the sword and is inspired. He isn't sure how Desser could have known all this but that doesn't matter. He is just determined to bring a victory to Desser for believing in him. Pram goes in for an attack but Desser screams in shock as the giant saw it coming. Pram shows that he's not to be doubted though as he slices right through the behemoth's sword and knocks him out. Pram credits the sword for being the only reason he is alive and says that it's all thanks to his father. They get ready to leave but Wuju Ken explains that the door can only be opened by the guy that's unconscious on the floor. He demands that they leave the sword but is shocked when Pram just slices his way out. On their way home they stop to get something to eat and Pram thanks Desser for everything he has done for him. Desser says it's not a problem and it's only natural to help a friend when they are in trouble. Pram breaks down and our silly protagonist wonders if he bought the wrong kind of food. Pram actually explains that he is crying because he was so lost and hopeless before. Now things are way better and he even has someone that considers him a friend. He is just really happy and thanks both his parents as he plans to follow the words his father left. We then see that his father wrote the words so my fledgling won't lose his way on the sword. Back at the school Romantica continues training really hard and displays her masterful control of the ball as she can now stop it right at the center of the circle. She celebrates but quickly realizes that she is alone. She tries out the challenge Desser originally gave her and is ecstatic when she manages to land every wind attack projectile right at the center of the target. Afterwards, she waits to meet with Dante and overhears people discriminating against her because she is in the beta class. Once she meets with him she scarfs down a delicious meal and Dante eagerly awaits to hear her decision about joining his party. Before she can even answer though he assumes that she has accepted and he prepares to take her to meet the other members of Blue Moon. Of course he is incredibly shocked when she returns the gift he gave her, so much so that his tiny brain can't even understand what's happening. Romantica tells him that it's not just that she doesn't want to go out with him, it's also because she just joined a party in the beta class. This dude is in complete denial as he thinks she's just joking, but she is very serious. Romantica explains that she didn't like the party at first, but that completely changed. 
The leader is training her and improving her skills. She reminds him of how he called commoners trash earlier, and he doesn't retract his statement. In fact, he doubles down on it. Romantica reveals that she used to be a commoner, causing him to nearly have an aneurysm, and he once again thinks she is joking. She is again very serious, but she says that everything is okay now, since she has people in her life that won't look at her the way he just did. This guy is finally getting the message, and he tells her that if he had known that she was a commoner, then he never would have invited her. Their conversation is over, but Romantic has one last thing to say. She reveals that her party is planning to get promoted to the Alpha class, and that makes them enemies. This makes Dante furious, so he states that he will crush every single one of them. Romantica simply warns him to not look down on them and leaves. This enrages him more than you could ever imagine as he looks like he's going to have a heart attack. We then get the reason why he is so angry as a flashback shows a group of angry commoners destroying his home and demanding the execution of his father. Dante is so angry that he causes himself to bleed and vows to crush the filthy commoners. Sometime later, Desser's team enters the ranking tournament and they are in the qualifying round. Romantica wipes the floor with a group of five people using her wind attack, and their victory moves them up the leaderboard. Pran does his part against another team, and they move up even more. Desser is the next to show what he can do, as our boy doesn't even move a single inch while stopping every attack of the enemy. The other two finish this team off, and our heroes reach the top 30, which means it's time for the real game to begin. Bridget is glad to see that they have made it so far, but is concerned because they will now have a huge target on their back. Elsewhere, the instructor in charge of the Blue Moon group is furious when he reads an article about Desser's team. The article points out that the team made up of beta class students has reached 30th place, and it questions if they will be the first ever to be promoted to Alpha. This guy angrily refuses to let them stay in their precious Alpha class, but he calms himself down. He explains to the Blue Moon students that while they are still only first years, it is their responsibility to uphold the pride and tradition of the Alpha class. For this reason, during the final round of the tournament, this psycho wants them to use any means necessary to eliminate Desser's team. He makes it very clear that they can never let them become single rankers. This guy speaks to Azess directly since she has fought Desser before, and she confirms that she is confident that she can beat him. She is the leader of the first year Blue Moon group, so he demands that she bring them victory. Azess can never forget the man that gave her her first taste of defeat, so she is determined to beat him with everything she has. Afterwards, Dante and Percival confront Azest. She thinks that they want to object to her being the leader, but they know how strong she is, and that is not what they want. Percival just wants to be the one that takes down Pram, and Dante wants to be the one that faces Romantica. Azest points out that they have a much better chance of winning fighting as a team, but these guys have serious personal grudges, so she allows it. She does, however, have one order for them. Azes shows that she has a personal grudge of her own as she tells them that Desser is off limits to them because she will be the one to defeat him. Elsewhere, Desser thinks about how Romantica and Pram both have enough skills now and he wonders if they are ready for the next step. His loyal teammates tell him that they are ready for more training for the final round, but Desser shocks them when he reveals that there is no training. Instead, they will be doing a special regimen for the final round. For this, they head to the library where Desser presents a bunch of books to them. Romantica is stunned when Desser reveals that he will be having them study history, and she must be reminded to stay quiet. The final round of the ranking tournament will take place in a shadow world prepared by the Academy. Historical incidents are recreated in those worlds, and if they're able to stop the incidents from happening, they clear the shadow world. Studying the history of these incidents will help prevent them, but they don't know which incidents will be produced. Desser tells them that he just used his intuition to pick some incidents at random for them to study but we know that our boy is from the future. He knows exactly what the shadow world for the final round is going to be. During their studies, Romantica teases Pram for admiring their teacher so much, but they end up getting Desser's attention. This dude is a fierce dictator as he demands that they get back to studying, all with a smile on his face. Moments later, the team is shocked as Azest approaches them. The moment is a bit tense, but Romantica breaks the silence by asking this chick what she wants. Azes points out that it's been two months since their fight, and Desser compliments her decision to join the Blue Moon. He thinks that she deserves to be in the strongest party in the Academy, but she questions if it's really the strongest since Desser isn't in it. Azest has approached him to formally declare war against Desser. Our time-traveling protagonist says that it's just like her to show courtesy for someone that she recognizes as her rival. Azest underestimated him that day, but she vows to defeat him with everything she has this time. Desser couldn't be happier to hear this, since he wants her to use that anger towards him to make her stronger. 
Our genius hero's entire goal that day was to ignite the fighting spirit inside her, and it has clearly worked. His friends becoming stronger is the only way they will be able to change the future, so he looks forward to fighting alongside the stronger Azest. Sometime later, we reach the day of the ranking tournament. Several portals have been set up at the center of a stadium, and reporters are busy interviewing instructors. The final round is a big event at the academy, so a lot of townspeople come to watch and it gets pretty loud. It's clearly a big deal as Desser's friends realize that he's wearing his tie properly today. Desser explains that he doesn't wear his tie correctly normally because it's just uncomfortable, but Romantica thought it was just because Desser liked showing off his chest. They all joke around and Desser's just glad that they don't seem nervous at all. They're all ready to start and head to center stage. All the other teams are ready as well and the large crowd erupts with cheers. One of the guys doesn't think that Desser looks very tough considering all the hype he has been getting, but some blue-haired girl tells him to focus. Some long-haired jerk chimes in though and reminds everyone that a guy like Desser isn't worth worrying about. A voice explains that the final round will begin shortly and reminds them that in order to clear the shadow world, participants must solve a certain incident. They are all allowed to use any methods to win, but if they receive fatal damage, they will be disqualified. Everyone gives each other dirty looks and it is explained that those who contribute to clearing the shadow world will receive more points. The top 9 players will receive the title of single rankers. Desser and his team are at the very bottom, so Desser explains that in order for them to become single rankers, they have to either clear the shadow world themselves or defeat every other participant. The gates begin to open and the final round of the ranking tournament begins. Everyone stares intensely at the portals and once they finally open, the large crowds begin screaming for their favorite teams. With the portals open, everyone finally enters, but Desser's team is last. Desser reminds his friends not to worry and assures them that they can do anything they set their mind to. They are separated before teleporting inside and a voice tells Desser that everyone's location has been determined randomly. Desser decides that his first objective will be to find his teammates, but he is instantly attacked by an ice bolt. The blue-haired chick from earlier can't believe how lucky she is to have found Desser right off the bat, and he just can't believe how famous he has gotten. This chick just wants to fight, but our boy easily melts her silly little ice attack. He gets pretty surprised though when she shows that she can use two spells at the same time and she uses her aqua wave attack. Desser stops it with another fire attack, causing steam to go everywhere, and he realizes that her other spell is a defensive one. However, he can't understand why she's doing it. It becomes pretty clear though when she cleverly puts the second spell in front of the first to freeze it and Desser points out that such interesting attacks are expected from someone in the alpha class. The blue haired chick is just getting started though as she uses a wind spell to violently throw around all the shards of ice from her previous attacks. This lady is pretty full of herself as she explains that her spells are a type of magic that a commoner like Desser would never be able to wield in his entire life. She asks Desser if he has any last words before she tears him to pieces but our boy doesn't have a single ounce of fear in his body. He admires her confidence but then really irritates her when he points out that she should be aiming for his vitals. Desser continues getting under her skin as he states that she must not have that great of a control over her own spell. She angrily tells him to shut his mouth so Desser knows that he's really in her head now. Desser is done messing with this girl and with a simple snap from his fingers, he destroys her entire attack. Of course she has no clue how he managed to do it but realizes that he's using inversing spells. Desser has full control over the fight now and teaches her a lesson. He says that she should never underestimate her opponent and she should always think about her next step. Those are the basics of war so he tells her to watch closely and ingrain it in her brain. Desser finishes up collecting all her shards to create a massive crystal and sends it right back at her. This chick is pretty dumb apparently as she simply says that there's no way that a commoner's magic can beat her. She thinks that she can easily stop his attack but our boy isn't done teaching her a lesson. He breaks apart the giant crystal to avoid her shield and easily defeats her. An announcement of her defeat is made and Desser points out that it's just one of many to come. Elsewhere in the shadow world, some little nerd walks around complaining about how hot it is in his random location. He wishes he had some sun protection but takes a moment to appreciate the breeze. This poor kid is quickly dropped by a powerful spell from Romantica and his disqualification is announced to everyone. 27 participants remain and we see that Romantica and Pram have already found each other. They were lucky to be transported near each other and Romantica thinks it's adorable when Pram is worried about Desser. She uses her wind magic to detect some nearby enemies and decides to go after the one that is all alone. Romantica sends out an attack but it's instantly destroyed and two enemies appear. 
One explains that detection magic has the downside of revealing your location to opponents, and her boyfriend reminds her that Romantica is just beta trash. Romantica doesn't take the insult lightly and decides that they should find out who the real trash is with a fight. The guy wants to keep talking trash about how much better their class is, but Pram instantly attacks him. This jerk just uses it as proof that they are lacking in manners, and Romantica realizes that they aren't that weak. Everyone gets on guard and the fight is let off with swords. The one girl tries using some magic, but Pram decides to show off his immense speed. The girl becomes terrified and begins to wonder if Pram is really in the beta class. The guy knocks up a bunch of dirt and tells his girl to blast him away with some powerful area magic. She begins the magic, but this only reveals her exact location to Romantica, and Romantica sends her flying with a wind attack. Romantica is the one making the insults now, as she calls them dumb for hiding themselves only to reveal themselves with an attack right after. The guy gets real upset, but Pram reminds him that he needs to focus on the fight. Pram is actually distracting him, and Romantica finishes off the alpha boy. Romantica thinks that he would have had a chance if he focused on defeating her first, and points out that it's what he gets for underestimating the beta class. 25 participants remain, and Ardua hopes that all of them are as dumb as these two were. The two compliment each other on how much they have improved, and Pram credits Desser for all their training. Speaking of Desser, Romantica tells him to come out from hiding, since she knows that he has been watching them. Desser was amazed by their progress, and states that he knew they could handle the situation on their own. Romantica realizes that Desser was the person she attacked earlier. She thought she had become strong, but Desser destroyed her spell so easily. Desser compliments her on how well she did, and gives her head a good pet as a reward. She was being so quiet that he thought that's what she wanted, but she gets really upset by it because she isn't a dog. The fun and games end as Desser notices a storm coming. Red lightning scorches the sky and something happens at a nearby clock tower. In the distance, a large fire attack erupts and we find that some poor guy got obliterated by another team. 18 participants remain and Desser explains that there are two paths for them to get promoted to the Alpha class. First is by finishing in first place by clearing the Shadow World. The other way is to simply survive and place within the top 9. Desser is certain that it would be impossible for them to clear the Shadow World since the other teams would simply gang up on them. There is a small chance that they can finish in the top 9 though. The other teams will be clashing against each other and they just need 9 more to get disqualified. Romantica thinks it would be much more difficult than he is making it sound, but Pram is confident they can do it. However, instead of drawing up a plan or doing something useful, Pram is simply doodling on the ground. Just then, they run for cover as it begins pouring rain and there are no signs of it stopping. They have no choice but to wait it out under a tree and Romantica comes to a realization. Aiming to be in the top 9 among the Alpha students would never even have crossed her mind if it wasn't for Desser. If it wasn't for him, then she would have joined Dante's team, and who knows what would have happened when they found out that she is a commoner. Desser can tell that she is uneasy and tells the both of them not to worry since he can tell they are getting way stronger. Our boy's Riz is really getting to her, but she calls him a weirdo and tells him to stop touching her head. She reminds him how much she hates his dumb face, but thinks about how she really loves her team. Just then, a bell rings in the distance, and everyone can hear it. Desser says it's finally time, and reminds Romantica that this was part of their studies. They are in the world of the previous clock tower. The previous clock tower is a high-level magical device that produces monsters at regular intervals. Just then, the clock tower activates, and we see that something is in the ground. A voice announces that a survival quest has been generated and the clock tower has produced a new monster. All the teams need to survive the monster's attack and all the teachers think it's bad news for the beta class. They are all certain that Desser's team is finished and the big dude in charge of the Blue Moon group laughs at Bridget. Back with our team, they hear a girl scream for her life and it's announced that there are only 17 participants left. Danger is approaching so Desser tells his two friends to stay back. Something begins to stink real bad and the ground begins to shake. A monster is coming, so Desser tells them to be on guard, and a rat emerges from the ground. The other two are terrified as the rat lets out a loud roar, and Desser realizes that they need to get out of there. A giant horde of rats appear, and Desser determines that this is because of a Kildra monster. It's a monster that uses a battalion of mice-like limbs. Its diet is human blood, and it never gives up once it has chosen its target. Romantica decides to fire an airball at them, but it's no use. They just need to keep running, but it's pretty clear that the mice are catching up. Desser explains that their only option is to beat the one in command. It'll be one of the mice in the pack, but Romantica thinks it would be like finding a needle in a haystack. Desser stops running as he knows a way to find the leader. 
He makes himself bleed and uses his blood to draw out the one in command. The dumb little rat reveals itself, and Romantica drops the thing right out of the air. The thing doesn't die though, and Desert points out that even though it's a little rat, it's still a monster. Its magical resistance is high, and even Romantica, with their current skills, can't beat it in one blow. The rats just keep coming, so Desert determines that he has no choice. He commands his team to retreat, but a shotgun pram jumps forward. The team tells Pram to stop, but this crazy kid runs straight into the giant swarm of rats. Elsewhere, the other teams are having just as much trouble with the rats, as there are now only 16 participants left. The red team is faced with a giant group of rats as well, but their leader confidently tells his group to stand back, and he uses a fire spell. The green team apparently has no clue what is going on, as they are glad to see that what they feared was just a tiny little mouse. One dummy tries to shoo it away, but the mouse lets out a battle cry, and they are swarmed. We then return to find that Pram is inside the horde of monster mice. He tells himself to focus and tries to find the one in command. He is certain that it took damage from Romantica's spell and is determined to find the little critter. After fighting the mice for a moment, he finally detects something. On the outside, Desert desperately tries to rescue Pram by tearing away at the mountain of vermin. Romantica wonders if she should attack with her air balls, but Desert points out that she will end up hitting Pram too. Desert panics as he begins to feel like he's going to lose Pram again, the same way he did in the future. However, just then, Pram emerges from the pile with a huge attack, and he eliminates the Kildra Mouse. It is announced that their survival quest is over, but Desert rushes to Pram as he is in bad shape. Pram receives praise from his friends, but he is exhausted. Desert tells him to get some rest, so the kid takes a nap. Desert puts Pram safely under a tree, as he is amazed since Pram is terrified of rats. Desert tells Romantica to watch over him, but says nothing else as he walks away. Desert is furious with himself, since he should have been able to clear the quest without making Pram go through all that. He realizes that he got carried away with their improvement, and he let his guard down. Desert punches his own face, and reminds himself that he is there, so he won't lose his friends again. He returns to his friends, who are worried about his face, but he says it was nothing. Desert's team is surprised that he wants to travel in the rain, but he explains that it's because they have found the previous clock tower. They head there, but Desert reminds himself of one more thing. He plans to take the perfect route to reach his goal, and vows to never make the same mistake again. Elsewhere, we see that the red team is amazed by how their leader burned an entire area to defeat their rat group. The green team won their battle as well, and has just used her ice magic to defeat their rats. Desser's group finally reaches the clock tower, and we see the leaders of all the remaining teams. Azes's team stares at the eerie clock tower, and it is explained that whoever stops it wins. They are confident that it will be a piece of cake, but the wind begins to pick up. Azes quickly realizes that it's not just any wind, and they must quickly defend themselves from a barrage of magic attacks. The attack is relentless, and even manages to destroy two guys from Azes's team. It's definitely another team doing it, and Azes points out that the detection and attack were almost simultaneous. Azes determines that it could only be one person, and we see Romantica up in the tower. It is announced that two more participants have been eliminated, and Desert thinks about how that means only 15 people are left. Azes and her two goons make their way up to the tower, but they must defend themselves from waves of air attacks. Romantica is really on her A game, but she apologizes to Desert since their opponents are blocking all her attacks. Their cover is blown, but Desert isn't worried, since they can just focus on another team. Romantica thinks Desert is insane for the suggestion, since that will cause all the teams to gather there. Romantica demands a response from him when all he does is smile, so Desert reveals that gathering all the teams there is part of his plan. He asks her to just trust him, so Romantica opens fire on the green team. The two guys had no clue what was coming, and their elimination is announced. 13 participants remain, so Desser prepares something by using his ability on a wall. Azes has Dante open the door to the tower, but they are shocked to see that the red and green team have already confronted each other. The red team's leader is named Gabriel, and he wonders if Azes' team was the one that attacked them outside. The green team was attacked as well, so they both accuse Azes of the despicable act. Azes demands proof of the accusation, so Gabriel points out that there is no one who can use so many spells of that level at once, except for them. Azes determines that they wouldn't believe her if she told them that it was a beta student doing it, and realizes that this must be Desser's plan. Desser's plan works perfectly as Gabriel's ready to get revenge, but Azes tells her two goons to stay back. Azes confidently states that she will take care of all of them, but this just annoys Gabriel. He unleashes a ferocious fire attack, and one of his fanboys explains that their leader is the strongest flame mage. 
The fanboy gets absolutely destroyed by a zest, and she also freezes another one of them. The green team decides to team up with the red team since it will be the only way they can become single rankers, but Azes is able to hold them off easily. The battle can be heard throughout the whole tower, but it is soon over. Desser surprisingly reveals that his plan didn't actually work though, and points out that there hasn't been any announcements. This means no one has been eliminated, and tension builds as our heroes can hear someone coming up the stairs. It's Azes' team and she explains that she only locked the others in place. Desser was hoping that they would all crush each other, but Azes has ruined his plan. She thinks his plan was dumb, and everyone pairs off against their counterparts. Azes exclaims that if they really think they deserve to be single rankers, then they need to fight and prove it. Just then, Azes uses her ice to isolate them on the next floor, and the fight begins. Dante goes right for Romantica, and Percival reminds Pram that he is his opponent. On the next floor, Desser seems to be in bad shape, but Azes tells him to get up as she is sure that attack wasn't enough to end him. She is correct as our boy was just faking, and he uses a spell called Stone Break. The stone that hits her turns into a dangerous snake, but Azes manages to freeze it just before it attacks. Our boy follows that up with some of his inversing magic that destroys her ice and covers the area in dust. Desser isn't taking the offensive and just hopes that something will make it in time. Down below, Percival has taken control of the fight against Pram, and he wonders why Pram switched swords. Pram mocks the mullet having redhead for doing too much talking, so Percival attacks with rage. He is certain that he is going to destroy the little kid, but is instantly surprised when he can't even hit Pram. Percival quickly realizes that his skills won't be enough, since Pram is a completely different fighter this time around. Pram kicks this dude right in the chest, and Percival can only wonder how he got so strong in such a short time. Pram refuses to tell him his secrets to success, so Percival gets enraged and calls Pram beta trash. Things are going much easier for Dante, as he easily fends off Romantica's attacks. The confident Dante wonders if that's all she's got, and Romantica thinks about how she doesn't have much mana left. She is at a severe disadvantage in close range combat, and Dante's ready to end the fight. Luckily for her, Desser's magic destroys an ice pillar, and Dante loses visibility. He doesn't think it's much of a problem since everyone has lost vision as well, but Romantica somehow nearly hits him. Her attacks continue and he wonders how she could possibly know his location. Dante realizes that she is using wind to detect him, and Romantica decides that she will have to end the fight while there is still fog. Unfortunately, Dante has an item that clears the fog, so he retakes control of the fight. He nearly slices her to pieces, and Romantica realizes that the item around his neck is the gift she returned to him after she rejected him. Dante explains that his little necklace is too good for a commoner, but Romantica tries to explain that they are all students regardless of status. They are all humans and that fact will never change. She is tired of all the segregation, but Dante is disgusted by the thought of a noble like him being compared to a commoner. Romantica is getting pretty sassy and demands that he tell her what the difference between them is. For Dante, the difference is everything, class, strength, and talent. They were different from the moment they were born. Dante has memories of what the commoners did to his father, and he refuses to believe that they are the same. Romantica has no clue about his past and just thinks that he is a crazy lunatic. Dante knows that she wouldn't understand even if he told her, so he plans to make her learn the hard way. Dante surrounds the area on fire, causing Romantica to counter with air. However, Dante is too skilled and knocks her back. Pram rushes to her side and she reveals that she just barely managed to survive. Dante tells Percival to stand back as he is finally ready to slaughter all the commoners. Dante's crazy is really showing now, but Romantica needs time to restore her mana. Pram prepares to buy her some time, but he is quickly swallowed up by Dante's attack. Dante heads directly for Romantica, but Pram frees himself to rescue her. Of course, this only gets Dante more upset with the filthy commoners. Percival reminds Dante that Pram is his prey, but Dante has lost his mind and proclaims that he will be the one to end them both. Pram explains that Dante tunnel vision super hard when trying to eliminate Romantica, so he was able to take advantage of that. Romantica realizes that in her current state, she won't be able to defeat Dante, and she will only slow Pram down. She comes up with an idea though, and asks Pram to lure this spiky haired redhead somewhere else. Dante is after her, so she wants to fight him herself, and she knows that Pram wants to fight Percival one on one. Romantica tells him not to worry, but Pram can tell that she is lying. He knows that Romantica is trying to sacrifice herself, so he refuses. Pram proclaims that all three of them on their team will become single rankers, and none of them will be left behind. 
He remembers the words of their fearless leader and reminds her that they are much stronger now. Romantica wants him to stop smiling because it reminds her of Desser's stupid face, but Pram just can't help it. Romantica thanks the kid for inspiring her and the two prepare for battle. Up above, Azes tells Desser that this fight won't end the same way the entrance ceremony did. Our boy is ready to fight too and agrees that they should fight to their heart's content. Azes shows off her insanely powerful magic, but Desser easily destroys it. Azes then uses magic to make her more mobile, but she is shocked when Desser shows that he can inverse that as well. She tries to end him with her next attack, but with just a single snap from Desser's fingers, her spell is destroyed. Desser doesn't give her any chance to react as he follows up with fire magic, but he is amazed when she was able to avoid it by encasing herself in ice. Desser compliments her for not even having a scratch on her, and she realizes just how dangerous Desser is. Thanks for watching my recap, subscribe and ring the notification bell for future parts.